Dear Professor De Vera, dear guests, good evening. And to those of you who have dialed in from other time zones, good morning, good afternoon, or whatever might be appropriate. We welcome all of you. My name is Richard Hub. I am the co-chair of Luther's Complex Disputes Resolution Group, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this fifth Luther Dispute Resolution Lecture. When Professor Krell and I some years ago devised the idea of the lecture, we early on agreed that we would not want to have the upteenth conference discussing minute details of arbitration law or international civil procedure. Rather, we thought we should have a lecture discussing fundamental issues of topical relevance. Um, as regards the lecture, please note that this is a purely academic event. Our speakers do not pronounce views of our firm or its clients, but have complete freedom as to what they're going to say. And frankly speaking, I have no idea what exactly Professor Devara is going to say, except that I'm going to look forward to it because the topic he's going to talk about exactly fits the idea of the lecture. Over the past two years, as most of you know, arbitration has turned completely virtual. Where you properly would have sent tons, or at least a couple of hundred kilograms of materials to Washington, Paris, or somewhere else, you now simply, with a mouse click, upload it to document storage. You send your documents via email around the world where they are stored on servers, laptops, notebooks, tablets, phones, you upload it to case management software and you do not really know where all this data is going to end. It is of course nice and proper because it saves CO2 and many of you will be familiar with the recent so-called pledge for green arbitration that also the arbitration industry should give its part in the reduction of carbon emissions. However, this raises questions. How does one properly protect these vast amounts of data? Formerly, you would have stored them in a locked cabinet, and once the proceeding is over, put them in an archive. And now everyone can make copies if he or she wants. You can copy it on a USB drive, and you cannot really ascertain where all of this is going to end. So there are interesting questions about cybersecurity. How do you guarantee the security? What do you need to do to guarantee? Even large firms, when you address them and say, like, okay, shall we encrypt our emails? Look at you and say, like, ah, we'd rather not. It's so bloody complicated. So, today's speaker is ideally suited to address this topic. <clears throat> Jacques Devra is professor and director of the Digital Law Center at the University of Geneva, where he teaches contract law, intellectual property law, and digital law. He holds a PhD from the University of Lausanne, at an LLM degree from Columbia Law School. Professor Devar has previously also worked at leading law firms in Switzerland, the US, and Belgium. He is a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Stanford Law School, at the City University of Hong Kong. He lectures, researches, publishes, and consults on contract law, IP law, and digital law, has widely published in leading law journals, and is a panelist at the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center as one of the roster of IP arbitrators of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. And all of what I just said is just the very brief summary of his CV. And Professor Devera, if I forgot to mention something, I ask you for an apology. My time as a, for an introduction is limited. Once again, welcome to this lecture and hand over to Professor Kroll. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, let me also welcome you on behalf of the Bucerius Center for International Dispute Resolution. We're extremely proud about the cooperation with the law firm Luther and the annual Luther Dispute Resolution Lecture, uh, which every year is one of the highlights in the academic year of uh, the Bucerius Center for International Dispute Resolution. This year, as uh, Richard already announced, we attracted one of the leading uh, authorities in the field of data protection, cybersecurity, and arbitration. And I'm extremely proud that when I contacted Professor De Vera uh, and suggested that he would hold the Luther Lecture this year, he said, immediately said yes. But then he said, unfortunately, I have to lecture during that week in Harvard. So can you change the date? And I had to tell him that we cannot change the date. 
And then he immediately said, okay, then I'm coming to Hamburg. You see how important the lecture already is. That's at least what we believe. Um, but we are extremely happy, Jack, to have you here and virtually, and we're extremely happy that despite uh, the short notice COVID intervention, you are willing to give that lecture online and everyone is looking forward to that. And without further ado, the floor is yours, Jack. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you uh, very much. Let me start by expressing my uh, deep gratitude to the organizers, uh, Dr. Richard Happ and uh, Professor Stefan Kröll, uh, not only for their kind words of introduction, but also for their invitation to join. And I must say that I'm extremely sorry that I uh, have to um, uh, deliver this fifth Luther Dispute Resolution Lecture remotely. As just mentioned, I um, got positive uh, because of COVID, not because I was in Paris at Paris Arbitration Week, but simply and stupidly here in, in, in Geneva, which is why I, I do really regret that I'm not able to join. Also because um, I would have been extremely pleased to come back to Bucerius, uh, where I had a chance to give a lecture back in 2013 in that same room, um, where I keep very strong memories. In any event, um, it's, it's a great honor for me to, to give uh, this lecture and I'll be pleased to share my PowerPoint presentation if this is of any interest after the lecture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, those of you who are not digital natives and perhaps there are some in the audience and who are as old or perhaps older than me, may remember um, this short piece, which was published some 20 years ago um, um, in, in the Wall Street Journal, some 10 years ago in, in the Wall Street Journal. This piece was by one of the most preeminent uh, venture capital investor in the Silicon Valley and was making the point, a quite simple point, which is basically every industry is a software industry. Now today, as you can see on the screen, I think we should ask the question whether every industry, every activity, be there in the public or in the private sector, is basically a data industry. In the data economy in which we live, uh, everyone who controls data basically can make a difference and can have a competitive advantage. Now in terms of law, I think we can somehow reformulate the question and ask ourselves whether data law might also eat the world at some point. With a focus on what's happening in Europe and specifically within the European Union. And of course, I'm only an outside observer of what's happening um, in the EU, but of course, a very attentive observer, uh, knowing that Switzerland follows extremely closely and in most cases does adopt uh, regulation which comply with what's happening and what may happen in the EU. First, of course, law and regulation to be mentioned when talking about this concept of European data law is the GDPR. And this is something, of course, that we'll be focusing on. But what you certainly know and what is worth noting in this short uh, introduction is to realize that a lot is coming. Uh, the European data strategy is extremely ambitious, um, as you can see and as reflected in, on the screen, making the EU a role model for society empowered by data. And we will experience in the coming times and perhaps in the near, very near future, three acts coming into force, Data Governance Act, Data Act and Data Markets Act. And I'm sure you're familiar at least in the, in the general um, sense about these Act, which will confirm somehow that uh, data law and European data law will shape somehow the future of the digital society. Now, of course, the idea for today is not to claim and to pretend that I will have a chance to even scratch the surface of all these different regulations. But the idea, as reflected in the title of the presentation, is basically to focus on two issues. The first one um, is the perhaps the more traditional one, which will take up probably most of the time for the presentation today, is to look at the application of data protection laws and cybersecurity laws in arbitration as such. So data protection in arbitration, 
and which somehow may be connected to one aspect of the title, which is risks. How do we manage the risk of the application of data protection arbitration, which will be the first uh, main topic to which I will uh, turn in a few seconds. And the second one um, is a different one, is um, perhaps about opportunities, uh, which is to look at how uh, data protection disputes might be submitted to arbitration. So the question is about arbitrating data protection disputes, and I'll turn to that second question later on uh, today. Now, of course, um, there is no way for me to offer a uh, like very detailed appreciation on each of every single question that may arise um, in this context. And my understanding, and that was reflected by Dr. Hap in his kind introduction, saying that the idea is to focus on perhaps fundamental issue or not to look at minute details. So the idea is not for me to look um, at every single issue that may arise about these two main issues that you have on the screen, and certainly not to give an expert opinion on the application of the GDPR, which is not my law, but rather to give an helicopter view on this, these issues and perhaps a outside helicopter view and outside EU view um, coming from Switzerland. I'm not saying this is going to be a uh, Swiss uh, rescue helicopter, but just to have a sense of uh, like the, the, the attitude and the altitude uh, that is needed in order to look at the issue from a certain distance and perspective. Now, when starting the discussion, um, it is of course critical to refer to that document that you have on the screen, the ICC IBA Roadmap to Data Protection in International Arbitration for the first topic, um, uh, for which a public consultation draft had been circulated and um, which was um, the result of a work of a working group to which I had the privilege to contribute. Um, and the essence and now the goal is to finalize that document, which should be done in the coming month. So this is an important document to which I will refer and to which I would invite you to look at if this is of interest to you. Now a quick, uh, I think it's, it's good um, to briefly go through a few um, aspects and definitions when we start the discussion about application of data protection in arbitration to realize first of all that data protection is a very broad concept because it can cover even though in the common language we tend to consider that data protection only focuses on personal data but as a matter of principle it's broader because it can pr protect and cover both personal data as well as non-personal data which can be industrial data but at the same time what is also an important lesson to keep in mind is that if we have a data set which combines both personal data and non-personal data, uh, this can lead to the application of the GDPR, which is the most protective legal regime. So there's kind of an absorption, uh, which uh, means that personal data regulation will apply to the entire data set. Now, in terms of personal data, you have the definition of the GDPR on the screen as soon as it relates to an identify or identifiable natural person who is the data subject, then this qualify as a personal data. And as you certainly know, there is somehow a tendency to apply broadly the concept of personal data. Same goes for processing. I'm not going to read aloud what you have on the screen, just mentioned for your reference. Uh, processing is also an extremely broad concept. Any operation uh, which is performed on personal data or a set of personal data qualifies as processing and triggers, consequently, the application of personal data regulation, specifically the GDPR. A few um, entities and persons who have to be mentioned, controller, uh, that's the person, uh, can be a natural person or legal person, as you can see, um, who basically uh, is in charge and managing the processing of personal data. The processor is the one acting, as you can read, on behalf of the controller. And you also have, and we'll get back to that later on, the concept of joint controllers, where you have two or more people basically determining the purpose and means of processing. And that's something that um, may also play a role, as we will see when we talk about the application of data protection in arbitration proceedings. 
Now, what about the principles? Here again, the idea is certainly not to enter into all details. You just have uh, on the screen the list of key and fundamental principles uh, which are reflected in Article 5 of the GDPR, uh, including lawfulness, so there must be a lawful basis for the data processing and all other uh, principles that are reflected on the screen, fairness, transparency, and I assume most of them, if not all of them, are self-explanatory, so I will not spend time and then purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality but the key point is actually the one at the bottom of the screen which is to consider and to keep in mind that the controller is basically accountable that all, all these principles are complied with and can thus be uh, exposed to liability if this is not the case in addition to these key principles the gdpr also provides for specific rights which are granted to data subjects, uh, including the one that you have on the screen and which may also have an impact um, in arbitration proceedings uh, as well as in other uh, circumstances in which personal data protection, right to be informed, right to access information, right to rectify incorrect information, right to be forgotten as it is called, right to measure, as well uh, as the right to move basically, to transfer the data from one um, setting to the other. So a few rights, uh, which are quite important, which are also at the core of the GDPR system, just for your reference here. Now, one uh, final point um, of notes when going through that very brief overview of some aspects of personal data regulation and specifically about the GDPR, is the consequences. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, and this is why also this is taken so seriously, and rightly so, um, damages meant you in case of violation, but also, and perhaps more importantly, administrative fines, um, which can uh, be quite high as reflected in the excerpt of Article 83 that you have on the screen, in addition to potential criminal sanctions. So this is a regulation with teeth, and which is why uh, all players, all uh, parties involved must uh, take that quite seriously. Now, let us now turn after this brief introduction to uh, selected issues and which um, relate to the potential application of data protection in arbitration proceedings. And the first issue, of course, is to look and we'll take each of these issues one after the other. The first one um, is basically to inquire as to whether personal data protection law apply at all to arbitration. So the question is whether. And then we will look as to who might be affected, look at how this may apply, and also uh, perhaps take a step back, that would be point four, what are the consequences? So what, meaning what are the potential implications in terms of policy, but also in terms of practical consequences to which I will come later on um, after having addressed the other issues on the screen. Now, one thing to note is that there are various solutions and various approaches. Um, of course, we may tend to focus on the GDPR, uh, which has become uh, perhaps a, a golden standard, as it's sometimes referred to, um, which also explains why we would have also at the global level to look very carefully at the development of European uh, data law. But the point here is to realize that other regulators may have adopted other solutions. And this is what results from the excerpt from this Brazilian data protection law, as you can see, which basically somehow puts on the same foot, so to say, uh, judicial proceeding and arbitration proceedings and somehow legitimizes the use of the processing of personal data in arbitration proceedings, not only for standard personal data, but also for sensitive personal data, which are a, a specific category of data which also exists under GDPR and other personal data regulation, which relates, uh, among others, to, uh, to uh, data about religion or political uh, opinions of the data subject. So you have a rule which somehow explicitly refers to arbitration proceedings, which is, as we will see, not the case in other regulations, specifically the GDPR. 
Now, this Brazil regulation further provides and somehow facilitates to some extent the international transfer of personal data by providing for a specific basis for that purpose, which somehow makes it possible in a facilitated way to transfer personal data in other countries because it is supported by the provision that you have under three, which is 33 paragraph nine, Roman nine of the Brazilian data protection regulation. Now, what about Switzerland? Uh, Switzerland, um, has a provision which doesn't refer explicitly to arbitration, but to pending civil proceedings. So this is the um, Swiss Federal Act on Data Protection, which is in force as of today. Um, knowing that, and this is what you have uh, reflected at the bottom of the screen, knowing that civil proceedings are conceived and are understood as including arbitration proceedings. So meaning that Swiss data protection law doesn't apply to uh, arbitration proceedings. And the understanding is that it doesn't apply to arbitration proceedings when the seat of the arbitration is located in Switzerland. But as some of you may know, there is uh, there was a recent revision which is supposed to enter into force uh, next year, um, um, which will lead to an amendment of the relevant regulation, uh, which somehow indicates, as you can see, and you have for the German speaking participant today, the official German text of the new provision, which basically states, as you can read, that the processing of personal data, uh, which is done in court proceedings, will be governed by the relevant rules of procedure. So meaning uh, here, the, the and this is the rationale that we'll see on the next uh, page, which is basically to say, if there are rules resulting from procedural law, there is no reason and no justification to apply on the top of it uh, personal data protection. Now, what is interesting to note, and this is what you have on the screen, this is taken from the official message uh, explaining the amendments to be made to the Swiss data protection law, which is to say that this new provision will also apply to arbitral proceedings, provided that the uh, seat of the arbitration is located in Switzerland. Now, the rationale is the one that I've just mentioned. Um, if there are procedural rules, um, uh, this grants sufficient protection so that uh, there is no need to apply the Swiss data that uh, should gazette the, uh, the law uh, for data protection as such. With respect to international arbitration, reference can be made here to chapter 12 uh, of the Swiss Federal Act on Private International Law, the PILA Act, as we sometimes refer to it, uh, which uh, is about international arbitration and which provides, among others, a right to be heard. Now, a quick, of course, practice point is to realize that even though as a result of these provisions, uh, there is a way to avoid the application of Swiss data protection law, um, for uh, arbitration proceedings with a seat in Switzerland, this certainly doesn't apply as such uh, that this would also avoid the application of foreign uh, data protection laws, including the GDPR, to which I'm coming now. Now, final um, quick comment with respect to uh, Swiss law, um, just to uh, mention that there is also an exclusion from the protection of Swiss data protection law for data processing, which is done by international organization. Um, and that may also be relevant uh, for um, the WIPO Arbitration Mediation Center, uh, the logo of which is at the bo bottom of the screen, uh, meaning that the data processing, which would be done in that context, uh, would somehow be excluded from the scope of application of Swiss data protection laws. Now, what, what about the GDPR? Uh, the GDPR is structured differently um, and uh, somehow doesn't generally exclude arbitration from its scope of application or doesn't provide any specific rules with respect to arbitration. You may think that certain provisions could have some relevance with respect to arbitration, including the ones that you have on the screen. And Article 33 of the GDPR provides for certain flexibility left to member states 
in order to restrict uh, the application, the scope of certain application and rights which result from the GDPR for certain reasons, including, as you can see, the enforcement of civil law claims, the protection of the data subject or the rights of freedom of others, other important objectives of general public interests of the union or a member state, or for the protection of judicial independence and judicial proceedings. Uh, another question, is it sufficient somehow to justify um, or, or grant a specific treatment to arbitration as such? Uh, this is left to the member states to decide, but as and the, the idea here is simply to draw your attention to certain provisions which somehow refer to proceedings or may have a certain uh, potential to relate to arbitration proceedings as such, and we'll get back to that um, under a certain um, perspective later on. Now, one uh, also quite important comment to make when we think about the GDPR and also about other um, personal data regulation is to think about the total scope of application. With respect to the GDPR, um, as some of you may know, um, there are like two connecting factor to geographic connected factors. The first one is uh, resulting from the first bullet point that you have on the screen, uh, which is the classical case in which the controller, respectively the processor is based, is established in the uh, union. The other one is less classical, is some kind of a targeting test where you have um, someone that is the controller or processor not established in the European Union, but somehow still offering goods or services to uh, data subjects in the union. Question here, would that apply or can that apply to non-EU based arbitrators who would offer services to data subjects? Uh, knowing that's important to insist upon, knowing that data subjects should be individuals, should be natural persons. So can we assume that non-EU based arbitrators are basically offering services to individuals based in the EU, uh, for instance, as a result of being listed um, on the roster, on the list of arbitrators of an EU-based arbitration institution, say the German uh, arbitration institution, uh, this is still um, uh, left for decision as far as I understand. And as you will see here, and this is something that you will also see later on today, there are a few question marks on my presentation, uh, which somehow means that from my perspective, at least there are still issues that would need perhaps to be clarified at some points. Turning now to the second question. So to whom does the, uh, the regulation, personal data uh, regulation, and um, specifically the GDPR can apply? Um, of course, everyone or almost everyone can potentially be affected. Uh, the arbitration institutions, and we'll get to that in a few seconds, um, do have to comply, provided, of course, that the conditions are met um, with um, GDPR and other personal data regulations. The arbitral tribunals and the arbitrators individually um, may also have to, um, to, to comply with these uh, provisions and obligations. Same for parties, council, and law firms um, to the extent uh, applicable, as well as third parties. So you may also have uh, other people processing data in the context of arbitration proceedings, uh, perhaps uh, parties or companies offering interpretation services and other companies uh, being involved in a way or another in arbitration proceedings. So what is uh, the, the um, the comment to be made on that uh, point is that here again, we can see that the scope, the personal scope of protection uh, an application is quite broad, uh, which um, needs somehow also uh, for further attention. Now, what about arbitral uh, and arbitration institutions? So arbitration institutions um, have of course set up uh, a mechanism and uh, ways to comply with their own obligation with respect to data processing. You have on the screen uh, a few examples, which are of course available online on the relevant websites uh, with respect to the application of data protection um, and the way how to manage uh, that by the relevant 
uh, institutions at issue, this ICC and LCIA by way of illustration. Um, with respect to arbitral tri tribunals, uh, this is where the issue might become more tricky is one question which arises is whether a, a three-member, classical three-member arbitral tribunal could be considered and shall be considered as joint controller. I um, already gave um, earlier this afternoon a quick definition which results from Article 26 of the GDPR of the concept of joint controller, jointly determining the purposes and means of processing. Does that apply to arbitral tribunals? The opinions in the legal literature are not anonymous. Uh, the risk um, is, is not minor for arbitral tribunal because it may lead um, to a joint liability as, as such in case of breach um, of the obligation under the GDPR. Um, now what uh, joint controllers are supposed to do, as you can see, and this is again an excerpt from the relevant provision, is to somehow agree and have an arrangement, as you can read, between them in order to determine their respective responsibilities. Unless uh, these results already from the law of the union or the law of member states, and with the question here whether the respective roles of members in an arbitral tribunal would result from the law of uh, the EU or the law of member states, which may depend, of course, on the relevant law at issue. If there is nothing resulting from the law, that would need uh, to be uh, clarified and to be um, structured in the arrangement to which reference is made here on the screen. Now, what about um, the other parties? Could we consider in an extensive manner that arbitral tribunals, parties, council um, may be viewed as joint controllers because somehow they do operate together in the course of the arbitration in order to ultimately solve the dispute. Um, you see, uh, this is a reference to the uh, ICC model terms of reference, which contain certain references and, and, and indications about the management of data protection obligation here. You see here, this is um, a view which somehow opts for the separate responsibility of each uh, and everyone the party, the representative, the council, and the arbitrators, um, which could be understood as kind of an exclusion of a joint control and thus of a joint liability uh, from that perspective. Um, what about um, the risk uh, that somehow the parties do not meet the data protection obligation? Here, a reference to another interesting and important document uh, adopted under the aegis of the ICC, the Model Data Protection Clause uh, for Postal Order uh, Number One, um, in which, if you read the provision on the screen, uh, you may have the impression that basically the party uh, who fails to comply would be the only liable in case of breach of the GDPR or data protection obligation. Um, it may not be certain that this is the case because if the data is used uh, subsequently in the context of the arbitration by other uh, entities, including the arbitral tribunal, uh, it is not certain that the arbitral tribunal and the arbitrators as such may avoid liability contrary to what may seem to be reflected in the provision that you may have uh, that you have on the screen. Let us now turn to topic three. How does it apply? Um, and one very, very important um, issue in that context is about lawfulness. Remember, lawfulness is one of the leading principles of uh, personal data protection. It's reflected uh, in Article 6 of the GDPR. Um, one basis and one justification for the data processing um, that uh, may come or should come into mind is the one reflected here. So uh, the processing is necessary, if I quote, for the purposes of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller or by a third party, uh, provided, of course, and there's a balancing of, uh, uh, int of interest which must be made as reflected in this provision, uh, provided uh, that uh, this is not overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject which require protection of personal data. In this case, actually, um, that might be uh, 
a, a good basis uh, which would justify and make lawful the data processing uh, because we deal with the legitimate interests pursued by the controller, and that could be the arbitrators, as well as third parties. So the other parties to the arbitration, uh, the arbitration institution as such, and perhaps the other arbitrators. So you see this is not only uh, pursued by the controller or by a third party, it could be by the controller and by third parties in pro reform. What about other bases which are uh, listed in Article 6 of the GDPR, one of which uh, is, as you can read, processing is necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is a party. Is that uh, relevant? Is that of use in arbitration proceedings? Um, it might be of use, but only if the cases uh, have parties who are natural persons, uh, because the requirement, as you can see, is that uh, the data subject shall be a party, um, in this case, to the arbitration agreement. Uh, if we're dealing with, and that would be most probably uh, the rule, the general rule, if you're dealing with arbitration cases with uh, companies and not with natural persons, that could not be a valid ground and valid justification. What about consent? Consent is a basis which is frequently mentioned as a matter of principle. In this case, um, looking at the way how it is perceived and discussed in various uh, documents, including the roadmap uh, to which I referred earlier, this is an inadequate basis uh, because it's a risky basis. And the risk comes from the fact and from the rights granted to the data subject to withdraw uh, his or her consent at any time. So that should not be, as a matter of principle, be used in order to justify to legitimate a use of personal data in arbitration. Even though, as I was um, mentioning earlier, there are no uh, express and explicit rules um, in the GDPR with respect to arbitration, there are some rules with respect to, and if I quote, for the establishment exercise or defense of legal claims. And that might be also viewed as a way to use these specific provisions in the context of arbitration proceedings, which makes it possible to process sensitive data, uh, which somehow makes it possible to avoid the risk of erasure or request of erasure of personal data that right to be forgotten that I mentioned earlier, and which may also facilitate the transfer of personal data to third country. So this is something that may have some relevance, uh, even though this is not specifically tailored to arbitration and not explicitly tailored to arbitration as a matter of principle. In any event, what has to be implemented, provided of course that uh, personal data applies, is to make sure that uh, arbitral tribunals, if they are submitted to this uh, GDPR or other personal data obligation, they do have to inform the parties and the other uh, participants to the proceedings and also to materialize that in uh, this data protection protocol. This is uh, taken from the note to the parties um, of the ICC uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with, which contain certain paragraph dealing with personal data protection and which also make sure to some extent that the, everyone is aware about data processing which shall take place and also quite importantly also imposes somehow on the parties to ensure as you can read at the bottom of the screen to ensure that the uh, applicable data protection regulations including the GDPR uh, are complied with so kind of a responsibility which is somehow uh, surfacing and which is imposed on the parties to make sure that there is compliance with the relevant uh, personal data protection. And you see that uh, reflected in different ways. I already alluded to the model data protection clause uh, for personal order when uh, under the aegis of the ICC. Uh, again, the reference to the uh, roadmap, which contains a quite uh, voluminous uh, 
annex, a list of annexes, including Annex 4, uh, that you have referred to at the bottom of the screen, which somehow suggests, as you can read, language uh, for possible use in either terms of returns or possible orders or a data protection protocol, which somehow makes it possible to address in full details uh, the relevance and application of data protection laws um, in the context of arbitration proceedings. What specific issue and for what specific um, um, topic may this arise more specifically, and this is something which was alluded to by Dr. Hamp uh, in his introduction uh, at the beginning of this session, um, the need somehow to make sure that there are uh, systems for a cyber protocol um, as resulting, of course, from the COVID crisis um, and the way how to manage the hearings, uh, including also uh, with respect to the use of online case management platforms, reference here to a quite interesting and quite uh, detailed document established uh, under the aegis of the ICC, uh, which was just published back in February of this year, which also um, provides for this checklist for issues to consider, as you can read, when choosing an online case management platform in which data protection issues should, of course, be carefully uh, looked at and identified and addressed, uh, which may also relate to the transfer, international transfer of personal data. Same goes for hearing. This is what we've discussed. You also have, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the documents that you have on the screen, the way how to structure the hearings. Um, um, even though these documents do not necessarily contain a lot of information about the management of personal data protection with respect to the use of hearing platform. And that's something that certainly should also be taken into account. And looking at, for instance, this uh, document recent, relatively recent paper, which was published in order to see which uh, video conferencing platforms do offer a sufficient level of protection uh, for uh, personal data protection. Now, how does that um, translate and how has that translated somehow in uh, the way how arbitration, uh, institutional arbitration manages this issue? So we've um, identified and presented briefly a few documents. Uh, this is also reflected in arbitration rules. Um, you have that reflected um, in the Swiss Rule of International Arbitration, the latest edition, as you can read, uh, which invites uh, the arbitral tribunal to do that quite early and to address the, the issue of data protection and cyber security uh, quite early in the proceedings. Um, same goes, and without, of course, uh, reading aloud what you have on the screen, um, for the LCIA arbitration rules, which has a new uh, data protection provision, which somehow also connects it to the issue of cybersecurity, which is the issue on which I will come in a few seconds. Of course, uh, this also uh, has a specific resonance and importance when dealing with uh, the taking of evidence, and it's no surprise that this is also uh, mentioned in the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration, which somehow um, invites also the tribunal to consult the parties and to address this um, quite early in the proceedings. Now, as to security. So security is, of course, a, a critical issue. Cybersecurity is in everyone's mind uh, and does also have a specific importance in arbitration proceedings. Um, you have on the screen the relevance, uh, the reference to Article 32 of the GDPR, which somehow reflects some kind of a principle of proportionality, saying that the level, basically, of the measure of security shall depend on the specific circumstances and list criteria for, for that purpose. What is interesting to note, and I'll get to that later on, is that uh, parties and entities may somehow uh, use either code of conduct or certification mechanism, which are regulated in Article 40 and 42, respectively, of the GDPR, in order to show that they do comply with the minimal level of cybersecurity as requested in Article 32 of the GDPR, which 
might be something uh, which could be of relevance for the arbitration community too. How does that translate and how has that been implemented uh, even actually before the GDPR uh, in a, the arbitration community, you have, and I'm not going to read uh, the provision, which is taken again from the notes to parties and arbitral tribunal from the ICC, which basically also reflects in essence what results from the GDPR as such and invites the parties and the arbitral tribunal to address that seriously in the course of the proceedings. Now, what happened if things go wrong. Um, if things go wrong, uh, there is a, an obligation to notify. Uh, and this is something which uh, results from Article 33. There are specific provisions and there is um, no obligation. This is why this is uh, underlined at the bottom of this provision of Article 33. There is no obligation to notify uh, if the personal data breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So they're kind of a balancing exercise here to be undertaken by um, the uh, controller uh, if uh, that controller is facing a situation of cyber breach. Um, now, if we look at the way how this is implemented, um, we may have the perception, the feeling that the obligation is broader, and that there is no balancing exercise to be undertaken. Of course, it would depend on the relevant governing law, uh, because if you look at the way how this is formulated in the notes, uh, any breach basically um, seems to be uh, the object of a report obligation um, to the individual, but also to the secretariat as a matter of principle. And uh, the ICC as such, this is a second sentence, uh, would also have to notify, uh, depending of course on the uh, circumstances. Now, if we look at the way how uh, personal data arbitration may apply in arbitration, you also have to think about the risk that arbitral awards may be challenged on the ground of a violation of personal data protection. Can that constitute a ground for annulment of an arbitral award? Can that constitute a violation of public policy? Uh, you see here question marks. Uh, this is debated as far as I know. Uh, this has not come uh, to application yet. Um, of course, it would depend on the circumstances, but it would seem somehow uh, a bit of a harsh result if uh, even a, a minor uh, violation of data protection could lead to an annulment of arbitral award or to a violation of public policy as a matter of principle, which is also an opinion which has been reflected upon uh, in the legal literature. And uh, moving also to the end of arbitration proceedings, one thing uh, which also uh, can trigger the application of data protection law is that concept of data minimization, minimization, which is one of the leading principles of data protection law and specifically of the GDPR, which also means uh, in practical terms that basically the file, the arbitration file, should be destroyed and should not be unduly retained. This is also one consequence of this general principle of data minimization. With this, I'm coming to the fourth and final point of this first part, uh, which is about the consequences. So we see there might be and there are potential practical implications and consequences as to the application of personal data protection in arbitration proceedings. So what does that mean? And what do we do with that? And what can we take away? So in terms of policy issues, I think one element which from my perspective at least, is, is quite important to keep in mind is uh, the issue of the independence and the autonomy, not only of arbitration institutions, but also of arbitral tribunals. Um, you have certain provisions in the GDPR, uh, which somehow makes it clear that uh, administrative bodies and so-called supervisory authorities shall not, and if I quote what you have on the screen, be competent to supervise processing operations of courts acting in their judicial capacity. Um, should that also, and this same reasoning, this same kind of uh, respect for the independence of the judiciary, should that somehow uh, be also applicable to arbitration institutions as such? You see uh, 
same type of reasoning, and again, the provision is a bit longer, I'm not going to read everything that you have on the screen, which results from the so-called Convention 108 Plus, which might come into force um, next year, which um, has been uh, negotiated uh, under the aegis of the Council of Europe, as you can see, uh, which somehow also makes it possible to limit somehow the scope of and the protection of um, beneficiaries and, and data subjects under data protection law, specifically with respect, and this is what you have on the screen, uh, when dealing with the impartiality and dependence of the judiciary and other essential objectives of general public interest. Here again, uh, could that and should that also apply with respect to arbitration in addition to classical judiciary and court proceedings? Now, in terms of practical issue, I think one very important key, uh, takeaway is to try to see how risks can be managed for personal data violation and cybersecurity breaches. Here again, reference can be made to this very interesting and recent ICC uh, Commission report, in which, and this are excerpts that are reflected at the bottom of the screen, cybersecurity protection is only as strong as its weakest link. And uh, as we certainly know, most cybersecurity breaches result from human errors, and uh, human errors are generally stupid human errors. So stupid humans as weakest link. And I think this is an important lesson to keep in mind without like focusing on arbitration. I think I couldn't resist from reminding um, what did happen a few years ago, not that long ago, when um, French TV channel was hacked, what they did basically after the hack is that they posted uh, the passwords to uh, the relevant um, network for their account on YouTube and Instagram uh, when the people was filmed and you see that this was basically what was reflected in the back. Uh, which shows somehow the level of lack of diligence to some extent, confirming that humans are frequently the weakest thing in that context. Other industry, uh, you may also remember, but I couldn't resist from sharing that with you today. You may remember the Ashley Madison scandal, which is uh, a hacking which uh, affected this um, dating platform, the extramarital dating platform uh, in which uh, it was revealed uh, the top five user platforms which were used um, by uh, users of that platform and you'll be struck to see how sophisticated they were uh, same goes for the password for the youtube account of the tv5 monde which is the, the topic that i just alluded upon on the previous slide which was basically and for those of you who read french uh, was basically the password of YouTube, which was the password for the YouTube account. Uh, meaning here again, there's still a long way to go um, to make sure that humans are not anymore the weakest link in terms of managing the security uh, and cybersecurity risk in arbitration and of course beyond arbitration proceedings. Now, uh, um, one thing that also might be considered and other measures of protection is to see whether codes of conduct could be adopted or certification mechanism, this is what I was mentioning earlier, could be um, uh, adopted um, for arbitration institution on arbitral tribunals, uh, by which perhaps a participant to proceedings could uh, rely and use this kind of conduct and certification mechanism in order to certify to some extent that they do comply with the minimum level of protection. What about cyber entrances for arbitral institution and arbitral tribunals uh, with the issue whether that might uh, cover uh, ransomware, which is an issue which is still debated in terms of managing cyber, cyber security risk via uh, cyber entrance uh, companies. And the third and final point, of course, without claiming to be exhaustive, is to try to think about the efficiency and validity of waiver of liability in case of cyber breaches. As we know, arbitration rules do contain, and you have two examples on the screen, um, of limitation of liabilities uh, for the benefits of arbitrators, but also for the arbitral institution, and many of which somehow uh, 
uh, do not apply also because of the application of a mandatory law. They do not apply in case of intentional breach of duty. This is what you have at the bottom of the screen or in case of gross negligence. So the question is, when is cybersecurity breach caused by gross negligence? Because if there is a gross negligence, the waiver of liability will not apply as a matter of principle. Um, reference here can be uh, made to the document that you have on the screen, this uh, joint protocol on cybersecurity and international arbitration, which offers quite detailed guidance on the measures, technological and organizational measures, which might be taken, and which would thus, if complied with, uh, might help uh, avoiding to be considered um, having caused, uh, having committed a gross negligence and thus uh, being covered by the waiver of liability that we just discussed. Let us now turn um, to, and do not worry, that's going to be shorter, to the second of the two issues that I wanted to discuss today. Um, which is more, as I was mentioning in the introduction, more about opportunities than risk to realize that perhaps data protection uh, disputes might be submitted to arbitration. So data protection is not only potential risk to be managed in arbitration proceedings, but may also offer interesting development in the future. And for that purpose, I will just give a few, here again, non-exhaustive examples of the type of issues and for topic two to five for potential application and situations in which one might consider and rely and submit disputes to arbitration in certain circumstances. But the first issue is try to think whether it is feasible at all, whether it is admissible at all to submit personal data disputes to arbitration. This is the issue of Objective arbitrability is the subject matter itself, personal data disputes, uh, subject matter. Is it possible to submit that to arbitration? Of course, the answer will depend on the relevant arbitration law. What you have on the screen is an excerpt from the Swiss Act on Private International Law, the chapter on international arbitration, which basically indicates, as you can read, that any claim involving an economic interest may be submitted to arbitration. Um, and that may uh, give rise to challenges with respect to personal data if we consider that personal data uh, do not entail any economic interests. You may have different solutions and different rules um, depending on the law, including uh, in Germany uh, as resulting from Section 1030 uh, of the uh, civil code of procedure. Now, with respect to Switzerland, quite interestingly, we had a case uh, a few years ago, which confirmed that one of the rights as granted from our Swiss Data Protection Act, which was the right of access, which somehow corresponds to some extent to the right of access, which is granted under the GDPR. This uh, dispute about the right of access in a financial setting um, about inheritance uh, between heirs was considered to be arbitrable uh, because was used as involving an economic interest. So the Swiss Supreme Court, the Swiss Federal Court, admitted that the dispute could be submitted to arbitration, um, even though uh, one party was somehow claiming that because of the kind of a personality, uh, like nature of personal data, this should not be the case. So this is one uh, confirmation somehow of a trend, I think, which would tend to admit the arbitrability of uh, data protection disputes. And we kind of see that also in other contexts. And one first uh, example is about the so-called privacy shield. Um, as uh, most of you know, this is no more relevant as a principle as a result of the so-called Schrems II um, judgment of the Court of Justice of the EU. But quite interestingly, this is why I still refer to it here, this system, the privacy shield framework, which basically um, had uh, kind of a US-EU um, side and also US Switzerland um, equivalent and corresponding setting, uh, the, this system did provide for arbitration and was somehow also implemented by the International Center for Dispute Resolution without that actually the issue 
of the arbitrability of this dispute um, uh, arose in that context, at least as far as I could see. Now, as you may have seen in the media, because it was uh, highly mediatized um, in the last days, um, the European Commission and the US have apparently agreed upon a new so-called transatlantic data privacy framework. Interestingly, this will provide for the creation of a data protection review court. Uh, this is a statement uh, coming from Brussels. You also have another statement here coming this time from the White House, uh, which um, doesn't give much more information about this data protection review court uh, beyond indicating, as you can see, that this will consist of individuals chosen from outside the US government. So does that mean that this will be considered and shall be structured as a arbitral tribunal, we should wait to see how that shall be put uh, into words in the, um, in the transatlantic data privacy framework that shall come into existence shortly. What about the so-called SCC, standard contractor clauses? So this is a system which is used uh, quite frequently in order to uh, make it possible to transfer personal data between the EU and non-EU countries. Uh, as you may know, uh, this is based on kind of a template provisions uh, which are adopted under the aegis and the leadership of the European Commission, which was done last year back in June. And if we look, and this is what I think is interesting to observe, if we look at certain of these provisions in these SCC documents, you will see that basically there are two types of disputes that um, are uh, potential to happen, but that can happen in that context. First, the classical uh, scenario, which is A, between the contracting parties, the data exported within the EU and the data imported outside of the EU. But less classically and quite interestingly, also disputes which can arise between data importer and data subject. And um, with respect to the first type of dispute, Somehow, surprisingly, which is why there is a question mark here, there is no arbitration clause. So there is a choice of form, a classical choice of form, and choice of uh, uh, which applies here, um, which means that it should be up to the court of an EU member state to decide on the dispute which may arise between a data exporter and a data importer. But, and that's what is interesting, if we look at the other type of dispute, what is um, quite um, unfrequent is that the data subjects are to be considered as third party beneficiaries. And that means uh, that they can somehow invoke certain rights and certain means of protection under the standard clause including and that's what is of high relevance here with respect to redress and what you can see here is that and this is the option which is reflected on the screen and if i quote the data importer agrees that data subject may also lodge a complaint with an independent dispute resolution body as defined in that footnote 11 that you have at the bottom of the screen uh, which provides as you can read the data importer may offer independent dispute resolution through an arbitration body only if it is, meaning the data importer, is established in a country that has ratified a new convention on enforcement of arbitral awards. So what is interesting here is that the, the data subject may have the right, no obligation, but the right to submit the dispute to an arbitration. The footnote 11 makes a reference to the seat of the data importer. Unfortunately, it doesn't make reference to the seat of the arbitration, which would be uh, relevant, uh, of course, uh, with respect to the implication of the New York Convention, which somehow means um, or may mean that it would be good somehow to look at this provision also from an international dispute resolution perspective and also from an international arbitration perspective to make sure that this systems do effective work uh, in practice um, as reflected here. Now, what about um, uh, the next category and without stopping too much into details here also in the interest of time, data portability dispute, you have a provision 
in uh, the GDPR, which is the one that you have here, which is basically the ability somehow to move your data around from one controller to the other. Interestingly, this is something that also apply uh, not only um, to personal data, but also to non-personal data in the light of the other regulation, which was adopted back in 2018, which makes it possible somehow to move your non-personal data uh, around and which somehow relies on this code of conduct. Um, here again, uh, interest to, interesting to, to mention that code of conduct can be of value here too. And in that context, uh, they have also referred um, to the development of so-called best practices. And this is what has been implemented in uh, the context of the so-called SWIPO, switching and porting from cloud providers. You may think this sounds quite complex and intricate, which may well be the case. But what is interesting to note is that in the way how this is structured, they have proposed um, what would be uh, considered, could be considered as a soft ADR system, um, which makes it possible, as you can see, to have this complaints body to act as a neutral body. It is not necessarily crystal, crystal clear to me, at least, what shall be the mission, because is it simply consisting of recommendation without binding nature? But the point here, even though that may uh, need perhaps to be clarified at some point, what is interesting is that for this also data-related dispute, there are ongoing attempts and ongoing developments which ambition to offer ADR services and perhaps arbitration services in that context. And very briefly, final point and final illustration, what about cybersecurity disputes? Can these disputes be submitted to arbitration? Uh, interestingly, there is reference, uh, at least an implicit reference to that um, in the same report that I've already mentioned several times today. Um, the parties, and this is the very bottom of the screen, may agree the forum where any dispute arising out of a security breach should be resolved, potentially by arbitration. And if you look at uh, the literature, and also as some case law, um, it might also be relevant to use uh, arbitration clauses in cyber insurance policies and to use arbitration mediation to solve cyber insurance disputes. This brings me to um, uh, the final point before just two quick comments as, as takeaway, um, which is also to refer to that document, uh, which were was co-established under the aegis of the Geneva Association, um, which is a group of uh, major insurance company, which here again, with respect to cyber attribution, as you can see, uh, reference is made not only to court judgments to define who uh, shall be the cause and the source of a cyber attack, but also potentially to an arbitration process, uh, which here again shows the potential opportunities for arbitration as such in the cyber space, which uh, now leads me to the final points that I wanted just to share with you in terms of concluding takeaways. The first one is that I think even though, of course, we should not underestimate and neglect the importance of data protection law, I think it would be fair to uh, ensure that data protection law should interact positively in a peaceful manner and should not, not interfere with arbitration. Now we're trying somehow to put that um, in a graphical way and try to see how that might be done in order to avoid like interferences and potential risk to arbitration proceedings uh, resulting from perhaps a too extensive and too aggressive application of personal data protection. And the second one relates to my second part of my presentation, which to realize that data law is clearly spending, uh, which certainly will translate at some point in an increase of data disputes, which uh, at least for some of them could be submitted to arbitration. And with this, I shall terminate my presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jack, for your um, interesting presentation about the risk and the chances of data protection.
and your tour de force through the GDPR. Um, you said the takeaway is a positive interaction between data protection and um, arbitration. And before I look at the various questions or ask the people in the chat to ask their question themselves, as well as the people here in the audience, um, let me tell you that um, I probably missed one of the takeaway. I'm a little bit worried about the interrelationship between arbitration and data protection. Um, in particular, that people try to use data protection rules as yeah, kind of guerrilla tactics against presentation of evidence, whatever. Um, have you come across that, or would you say that is not an issue really in an arbitration? Do you have sufficient uh, permission to allow for uh, whatever you need to protect, properly protect one of the parties to properly uh, ensure right to be heard, that there's no conflict with data protection? Thank you, um, Stefan. Uh, it, it's, uh, of course, a critical question. Um, I'm not naive, uh, but I'm still trying to convey a, a positive perspective on, on the interaction between data protection and arbitration. As to your question, this is something which I have experienced also in, a, in an arbitration case. But to me, and that's where I, I try to uh, think and look positively at the issue, it's um, also the mission, of course, of the arbitral tribunal and the institution to make sure that these guerrilla tactics don't succeed and make sure that we use the existing tools. And I would, um, among others, also refer to the way uh, how arbitral tribunals can get guidance by using uh, the IBA uh, document uh, on the taking of evidence to try to assess whether certain evidence might be admissible or not uh, by looking indeed at the way how personal data protection uh, might come into play and might come into application, but not uh, considering as a matter of principle that data protection shall prevail in all circumstances. Uh, it certainly uh, might be a source of concern, but to me it's also a call for a reasonable application to some extent. Uh, this is why I also wanted somehow to take a step back and try to look at uh, the dispute resolution ec ecosystem as such, and to look at perhaps privilege that uh, courts may benefit in terms of application or non-application of personal protection, and, and to see to what extent that might also uh, be used for the benefit of arbitration institution and, uh, and arbitral tribunals as such. Thank you very much. Any questions here from this audience? The question? Any questions from the chat? I just see there is no question from the chat. Um, I would have, Jack, final question then from my side because that was also something which I asked myself um, coming as an arbitrator from Germany. And you just said that in, you described the Swiss arbitration or Swiss data protection rule. And uh, as a German arbitrator, you're bound by the GDPR. In principle, wherever you travel, uh, you're somehow affected by that. Um, when I heard your, or your description of the Swiss rules, I had the impression that in Switzerland, the Swiss protection rules apply if the arbitration is in Switzerland, but if a Swiss arbitrator travels, let's say, to Asia somewhere, the arbitrator is not submitted to any data protection rules of Switzerland. Um, is that correct? And would you consider that perhaps again to be a competitive advantages, advantage of a Swiss arbitrator, which is yeah, then not traveling with it with a bag and barrage of um, a data protection, very strict data protection rule? So, um, um, as we know, and um, that's also one tricky aspect of uh, personal data protection, is that the territorial scope of application doesn't only result from uh, the seat or the residence or the location of the persons who are processing the data, uh, but also from other factors. And, and as we discussed, 
Um, one question which is still um, unanswered, at least as a matter of principle, is to try to see whether someone offering, uh, and that would be a um, uh, the other sequences of application of the GDPR uh, in the light of Article 3, someone offering uh, services to EU-based uh, data subject, could that uh, be sufficient to trigger the application of the GDPR? Um, if you are listed, and that's the example that I was mentioning, uh, of someone, a non-EU-based arbitrator being listed as one of the arbitrators on the, the DIS, for instance, website or the uh, German uh, Arbitration uh, Institute, is that sufficient uh, or not? I'm not sure um, because uh, the, this targeting test, so to say, uh, is um, a um, design to target individuals. And my perception is that uh, arbitration cases, and you don't have necessarily arbitrators targeting individuals for getting potential arbitration uh, mandates um, because it's mostly something which is a business to business activity. So from that perspective, there might be, to your question, a competitive ad advantage to some extent of not being based within the EU, even though, and that's what I was mentioning earlier, even though uh, the simple place uh, of residence uh, is not sufficient to exclude the application uh, of any personal data regulation. So I think this is something that um, might be uh, like one of the factors uh, which could be could be considered among others. Uh, but my more general uh, point is reflecting uh, again on uh, perhaps the interest to try to look at ways how to minimize the burden that personal data protection and the application of personal data protection may have on the arbitration community uh, more generally. Now we have some questions, so it wasn't the last question from the chat. Um, there is someone, uh, Divya Vivedi, uh, advocate. Do you want to ask your question personally or because I haven't seen it in the chat? Could you put her on the, on the screen? Thank you, Professor, for Uh, for an amazing presentation. So I have a uh, query related to the point where you were talking about data portability disputes. Uh, in the same context, I would like to understand what do you think about data localization, which India is promptly uh, advocating more because we do not yet have data privacy laws, but we do have a bill. So how do you think that will affect the arbitration which we are talking about here? as in when we talk about data localization per se. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Zoma for your question. So data localization is, um, is a uh, very broad and different policy discussion, which is also debated and, and being uh, based here in Geneva um, and hearing what's being somehow in the air in the international uh, organizations com uh, community, this is something um, which is much broader than the discussion that we're having about arbitration. Now, uh, if we, to your question, perhaps with a focus on arbitration, if we do have a system of localization of data, um, that may somehow facilitate to some extent uh, the management of personal data, because in that case, you would avoid uh, additional difficulties that uh, are generally uh, resulting from cross-border data flaws. Uh, so that might be a way uh, how to uh, somehow manage certain risk and also manage perhaps better cybersecurity risks in order to, to ensure that you have a perhaps more secure uh, um, organizational and, and IT um, infrastructure for, for arbitration proceedings. But uh, I think um, as, as mentioned, Data localization is is a, a is an issue which clearly is not only uh, of relevance in the context of, of uh, arbitration proceedings, but just much broader, a much more fundamental policy issue. 
Thank you. Then we have a question from Mark Beckett. He wants to know how difficult would it be for an arbitrary institution to obtain a certification under Article 4042 GDPR? And then is it clear that this would extend to tribunals organized under those rules? Um, since the ICC famously claims any control over proceedings before ICC arbitral tribunals. Last but not least, would it be practical for individual arbitral tribunals to obtain certification? Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, to be frank, and that's where I must, of course, disclose my limit with respect to the uh, effective and real-life implementation of GDPR obligations. Um, my perception is that it shouldn't be uh, excessively challenging to uh, set up the system of certification and same goals for code of conduct because this is something which was um, put in place and made available in order somehow to facilitate um, uh, the, uh, the compliance by relevant stakeholders across the board, so not only uh, with respect to a specific industry, the arbitration industry, but other industries. So uh, the essence uh, itself is uh, that it shall be um, relatively easy to, to set up. Now, as to what that might mean in more concrete terms for the arbitration community, be the arbitration institution or specifically uh, arbitral tribunals, and to your second question, which is on the chat, what that would mean uh, for individual arbitral tribunals to uh, obtain certification. Uh, this would, of course, depend on the way how it is structured. I was simply, uh, in preparing this presentation, trying to look at, at ways how somehow to facilitate the management of security, cybersecurity measures uh, also in the arbitration community in the same way as this is done and this is being done in other industries. And I was mentioning uh, um, code of conduct as well as certification as a potential way to manage that. Uh, but to, um, to the practical limitation, I would suggest that this shall be addressed and perhaps there's someone in the room or in the online audience uh, who could perhaps uh, speak in, in more details about that. And the final question from Ariano Spina. She wants to know what do you think about data protection and the evidence used from WikiLeaks in arbitrations? So, yeah, uh, here again, it's, it's a general question because WikiLeaks might not necessarily uh, refer only to personal data protection. So the, the management of quote, quote, illegal um, evidence um, should be treated um, perhaps uh, um, in the way that I was mentioning earlier in saying that uh, all the factors sh should be taken into account, including personal data protection, and that should be basically based on, on the assessment uh, and perhaps uh, in the light of the guidelines of the IBA uh, rules on behavior and evidence. I think uh, there's no reason, and if I put it differently, I think um, even though obviously there has been, uh, for good reason, uh, a lot of activity and a lot of focus on personal data protection, and that will certainly continue, um, we should not lose from sight uh, that this is perhaps just one circumstance out of more general scenarios on, and other scenarios in which uh, the travelers may have to make decisions in the light of the circumstances. Thank you very much, Jack. That was a very interesting lecture. And uh, let me tell you that um, at that stage of the day, in my age, I normally fall asleep. Yeah? After that, uh, I stayed away for, uh, awake for more than an hour. And to give you some token of, my, of our appreciation, we have the famous Butzerius tie. I hope you don't have already one. They changed it at I a don't. certain point in time. And your German head of state wear it, and sometimes even professors yeah, presenting here. So we will send it to you. Thank you very much again for an amazing lecture. Thank you.
So thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for everyone uh, watching us uh, virtually from wherever. And I've seen people from India, from Latin America. Uh, so that is the advantage of uh, the virtual world that you reach people everywhere. We have a small reception downstairs uh, for those of you who want to have some drinks and exchange views, discuss about data protection, arbitration, or anything else. Uh, you're clearly welcome downstairs. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you at the sixth Luther Lecture then. Thank you.